Sorry about this initial fiasco. Uh, let me just try to go ahead and uh, you know uh, start from where I left in the last class. So in the last class, what we found is that if you have a Maradona fermion, you can pick up signature of that fermion either um, in this normal, either by making a normal metal superconductor junction. Okay, so wherein uh, you would see that uh, uh, there would be a peak. In the tunneling conductance in the middle of the gap, that is at uh, Fermi energy, which we call zero energy. So it's called a zero bias peak. And uh, we understood that to be a consequence of the fact that there is a Majorana state out there where you can put in a particle. And therefore, it gives you a peak in the density of state. And we also discussed why a localized state there could lead to a signature in current and why we could put in. A standard quasi particle in a Majorana state. Okay, so those uh, so those are there. But now let me go into something. Okay, now I can't move my slides. Ah, yeah. Okay, good. Okay, perfect. So and we did see signatures of this uh, peak. You know, at uh, as we increase this magnetic field in the experimental geometry and strong magnetic field is supposed to be the place where you are to, supposed to see the peak. And uh, however, there is still a still an issue, an issue in the sense that uh, um, suppose I have a superconducting um, you know, nanowire like that. However, there is a chance that there are peaks in the middle of the gap because of disorder. Okay, because there could be additional states which could be there. So what we need really to seal this observation is a phase coherent uh, signature of this Majorana fermions. And by phase coherent, I mean that it has to do with the phases of the superconductor, and therefore uh, that effect cannot originate from disorder or other things which are phase incoherent. Okay, or which doesn't involve the superconducting. Now we know that the traditional phase quotient signature of a superconductor is Josephson. Okay, so uh, the general thing is that if you take two superconductors and place them side by side, and if they have a difference in phase, then uh, when you put them together, you find a current which is uh, proportional to this phase difference, sign of this phase difference. Okay, and that's what Josephson did. So here is a basic caricature of Josephson effect. So if I take two superconductors, which has a global phase of phi one in the left superconductor and a phase phi two in the right superconductor, the ground state wave functions then uh, have different phases for S1 and S2. Okay? So now if I put them, put these two together, the wave function sees the phase gradient at the boundary. And what Josephson showed is that because of this, this imaginary part of psi one star psi two, which is like a current, uh, which is proportional to the current, of course, uh, you know, that is going to show a, a, a finite current, uh, which depends on the difference of phases of these two superconductors. Okay, so this was the basic Josephson effect, and essentially this thing was taken, uh, studied in great details, particularly by the Russians. And a uh, very good review article is there by uh, Likharev, uh, okay, which is a compendium of all kinds of Josephson effect that you can think, think about. Okay. However, so just to summarize, the, you know, the, just to sum up this thing. So you do have this Josephson effect and later what people found out is depending on the type of junctions that you make, you essentially come up with two different classes of junctions. One of them is called a SNS junction or weak links, where two superconductors are separated by a normal region, which is rather long. Okay. And the other one is called a tunnel junctions, where these two superconductors are separated by a barrier potential, okay, an insulating barrier, maybe which is typically modeled again as a delta function potential. And therefore, uh, you know, one can. So in the rest of this talk, I'm only going to talk about these tunnel junctions. 
not about weak links. They also have their own interesting physics, but for our purpose, we are going to study this tunnel. Okay. So with this brief introduction, by the way, any questions, anything which is unclear? Uh, so I just wanted to you know, sort of give a very brief introduction to this. So with this really brief introduction, let me try to sort of go ahead and uh, look at this tunnel junction. So if you have two superconductors with phases phi one and phi two, and I'm going to call phi to be the phase difference, that is phi two minus phi one everywhere, separated by a barrier potential, the question is how do you calculate this Josephson effect? The answer to this is that it's not very different from what we have done previously for calculating this mid gap state. So let me go ahead and show you the details of this calculation just a bit so that uh, Okay, so this was our mid gap state calculation. So let me just go to the here. So this is what you do. You see, the point is here to understand is that the Josephson current can be understood as the uh, phase gradient comes from the phase gradient. Okay. So what happens in this Josephson junction is that uh, if you bring these two superconductors close to each other, uh, one finds that at the barrier where the pair potentials from both region one and region two kind of takes a deep and goes to zero, there are bound states which is which lies inside the gap, and the energy dispersion of these bound states essentially depends on the relative phase between the two superconductors. Now, if we can find the energy dispersion of this bound state, then I have an energy which is a function of phi, and therefore the derivative of this energy with respect to phi is going to give me the Josephson current. Okay. Notice that the other states in the superconductor, which are typical subgap states, never depend on this phase phi. Okay, it always depends on mod delta square and therefore is independent of the phase of the pair. Okay, so in this way, these bound states are special. So now to calculate that, what we do is that we just solve the quantum mechanical problem where you have this superconducting quasi particles in the left and the right superconductors, which can move right and left. And there is a barrier potential in between. So I'm just going to show you a sketch of this calculation. So in the left superconductor, or rather say in the, yeah, so, um, yeah, so in the left superconductor, um, okay, so this is, sorry about this notation. So what I mean is this superconductor, S1, okay? So for this S1, what happens is that you have two coefficient, AR and BR. And this corresponds to right moving and left moving quasi particles in this superconductor in region one. Okay. And they are coefficients which one needs to determine from the Bugulib of Dijan equation is UR and uh, UR plus and VR plus and UR minus and VR minus. So the right moving one has a momentum dependence of e to the power i k f. And uh, the left moving one has a momentum dependence of e to the power minus i k. Okay, and because in the these are localized states, it has to decay, and in region one, it decays to the left, which means that it would have a plus kappa. I. Kappa is a real quantity, okay, and that's essentially inverse of the decay length. Similarly, in the in region two, you have a similar uh, situation, except that now you have a minus kappa x. This kappa, you know, uh, is still positive. It's the decay because it decays to the right for x greater than zero, I have taken this barrier to be at x equal to zero. And then once we know this, okay, uh, we now want to find out uh, what, what happens. Uh, so, so we are left with two tasks. One of them is to find out what these u's and v's are, how do we find them? And the second one is to find out what is the boundary condition that we need to Okay, so the point is, okay, so if I combine this right and left thing, then I can write a general beta, where this beta takes values plus and one, plus and plus one and minus one for the left and the right superconductors. And then one can show, and I'm not doing this right here, but it's a straightforward thing, that for these, the Bugulib of Dijan equation that determines this U's and V's can be written as something like this. So for example, this alpha beta always takes values plus and minus one. 
beta is plus one for the right superconductor and minus one for the left super, sorry, plus one for the left superconductor and minus one for the right superconductor. And alpha is plus one for right moving particles and left uh, and minus one for the left moving particles. And from here you determine this. Okay, so we know all these Vs. Now what you do is that you say that, well, my wave function in the right and the left must be identical uh, at x equal to zero because that's the continuity of the wave function. And the current continuity also demands that the gradient of these wave functions at x equal to zero has to be discontinuous by a quant uh, because there is a delta function potential, okay? So this z essentially is 2m h u naught by k f, um, sorry, let me just, yeah. so 2m u naught by h bar square k f, and I have taken a potential, which is u naught times del delta x. Remember this u naught has a dimension different from the potential, so this z is dimensionless, okay, because of this delta function. And therefore, I also define this quantity d, which or otherwise capital T, I can, uh, so, you know, in different pages, I'll probably call them either capital D or capital T. But the point is that this z essentially is the signature of a dimensionless barrier strength of the potential, okay? So uh, how strong the potential is? So in the limit where this potential is very large, this quantity, which is often called the transmission transmittance of the junction, that goes to zero if z tends to infinity and it goes to one if z goes to zero, okay? And we then what do we do? We take these four, uh, so we take these equations and we substitute side right and side left here. So we get four equations, okay, from there, two for the top components and two for the bottom components. And then we have two unknowns, which are A right and A left, B right and B left. So we just eliminate those to get the uh, energy dispersion. Okay. That's what one typically does when one uh, works with this Josephson junctions. Okay. So this gives us the Andre bound state energy. Okay. So doing this, of course, takes a few pages of calculation and you know maybe even in complicated cases, help of Mathematica, but one can do this. So any questions? Anything which is unclear? Okay, if not, let me get back to the main, uh, this thing. Oops. Yeah, so what? So after we have solved this, in case of a standard SOF superconductor, what we find is that the energy dispersion of this bound state depends on sine square pi by two times this transmission, which was this D that I defined before, and Z is the dimensionless barrier state. Then one can compute the current. The current is simply uh, the energy dispersion divide, uh, the derivative of the energy dispersion with respect to phi, multiplied this by factor 2e over h bar. And then this Fermi factor, f en by kbt naught, that's just the Fermi distribution function. That just takes care of the fact that uh, you need to have an occupied state to get the current, which means that at zero temperature, you have to be below the Fermi energy to see this current. Okay, the states only below the Fermi energy is going to contribute. Okay, but in general, you can have contribution both from states below and above the Fermi energy, but that's going to be more modified by this Fermi distribution factor. Now, once you do this calculation, there is a very interesting thing that happens. Okay, so you see that there are two limits, one in which this transmission goes to one. Okay, that's called the transparent limit or often called the kulik umeluenchuk limit. Uh, big, uh, in, the name is because of two Russian gentlemen who first came up with this uh, concept. So there the current goes as mod sine pi by two, okay? And ICRN, 
this IC is the critical current of the junction. That's the maximum current you can pass through the junction before destroying superconductivity. And RN is the normal state resistance, meaning that if this S1 and S2 and the barrier, they, had, uh, they are such that S1 and S2 has zero superconductivity, so delta naught goes to zero, what would be the resistance of this whole thing? Okay, that, that's your normal state resistance. So essentially, the product of this ICRN happens to be an universal constant. And it's pi in units of delta naught over E if you are in the Kulig omelu and Chef limit. And in a usual junction, this monotonically decreases to half its value for the transparent junction. When you are in the extremely strong uh, barrier limit, where T tends to zero, and that's called the Ambegaokar Baratov limit. Okay, so Vinoy Ambegaokar and uh, Baratov were the first people to sort of look at this. And you see that the current has a different uh, dispersion now, as a function of time. Okay, so, uh, so that's the basics about conventional tunnel junctions. So you have these two limits, Kuli Komelu and Chuk and the Ambega Okar Baratov limits, and you move from one to the other as you increase the barriers. Now, the question that one comes is that what happens when you have Josephson junction where there are these Majorana bound states? Okay, how does this work? And to see this, one can sort of now replace this wave function instead of a S wave by a P wave by putting a simple Kx by K factor so that as we have seen before, that this kind of wave functions, uh, if you have a junction at the edge, gives rise to a Majorana dispersion. And we do exactly the same thing what I have shown you before. So we compute, uh, you know, we enclose this boundary condition and just compute this uh, Josephson. And what one finds is really interesting. So forget about this algebra here. What one finds is that if you have a P wave junction, that is a junction where you have this Majorana bound states, the dispersion changes in a fundamental way. The way it changes is that instead of a 2 pi periodic Josephson uh, junction, where, you know, so you see that this S wave case, this is certainly 2 pi periodic, D is the transmittance of the junction. Okay. Here you find that it becomes 4 pi periodic. That is the periodicity of the energy dispersion, they double, okay? And here is some plots. Uh, you see that these lines, you know, the dark lines at the top, just follow my cursors, they correspond to uh, SOF superconductor, okay? And uh, these SOF superconductors essentially, uh, so the thin lines are the ones in which the transmission is unity. Okay, and the thick lines are the one with finite transmission. And this is the one with P wave superconductor, okay, where you see this four pi uh, superconductivity. So essentially, this Majorana modes has a distinct signature in Josephson effect. It gives rise to a different periodicity of the Josephson current. So uh, in the phase phi, it's four pi period rather than two pi. Uh, interestingly, what happens is the following. You see that, uh, of course, this, what I told you about uh, regarding this phase difference is what we call a DC Josephson effect, but you can also think of an AC Josephson effect. So Josephson junctions are perfect converters of DC to AC voltage. For example, if you just put in an AC DC voltage as an input to this thing, phi goes to phi plus two EVT, where E is the charge of the electron, B is the DC voltage that you're putting and T is time, okay? So as a result, um, it essentially gives you uh, AC current, okay? So you put in a DC voltage and you get an AC current, which is essentially a perfect converter. However, in this case, the oscillation periodicity is going to be not to EV over H bar, which is the standard thing in uh, Josephson junctions, but EV over H bar. This uh, represents a fractionalization of the AC Josephson effect frequency. That is, you know, typically when you have an AC Josephson effect, 
there is a there is something called the Josephson frequency. It's called two EV over H bar. That's typically the oscillation frequency of the curve. Okay. Here, what we find is that that oscillation frequency is halved. In other words, it becomes EV over H. So the point is that these kind of Josephson junctions have fractional AC Josephson effect. Okay. So that's the signature of this Majorana modes. Any questions? Okay, if not, let me go ahead. The other interesting thing that happens with these Josephson junctions is when you put in an AC voltage in the junction. Okay. So previously we saw that if you put in a DC voltage, you are going to certainly get uh, you know an AC current. So if you ignore this V1, if you just put a DC voltage, which is V equal to V0, you get phi, the phase, and gets an initial phase phi0, and then a omega j times t. This omega j is called the Josephson uh, frequency, and it's given by 2 EV0 divided by H bar. Okay. So here, this particular quantity, 2 EV0 divided by H bar. Now, you see the interesting thing is that in on top of that, if I put a AC voltage out here, what happens is that then you need to take this whole phi out here and put it inside a, inside a sine function. And we know that sine of a sine is written in terms of Bessel functions. And so you can expand and do a bit of tricky things. But the point is the following, that if the voltage that is omega j, you know, this Josephson frequency essentially equals the drive frequency that is this omega times an integer, then this time dependent part of the current vanishes and it becomes completely DC. So if you just measure the DC current, DC current corresponding to the applied voltage, you find that at particular frequencies, which satisfies this relation that 2 E V naught by H bar, that is omega J equal to omega, the DC component of the current voltage characteristic have spikes. Okay. If you flip this curve around, of course, uh, you are going to see steps instead of spikes. And those are famously known as Shapiro steps. Okay. If you plot V versus I, you are going to get steps. You know, this is just a standard thing. And these are called Shapiro steps. Okay. So they represent a anomalous, well, additional DC component of the current due to an AC applied voltage. And that's called, uh, that's the Shapiro steps. And this Shapiro steps always occurs in integer multiple of the Josephson uh, frequency, 2 EV naught by H bar equal to K omega. However, if this Josephson frequency is now halved, Okay, which we see in case of Majorana fermions, it turns out that steps can only occur at even values for even integers and not the odd integers. Because you see that um, here, if you have so he, so from here you can see this that you know if this is EV naught over H bar, then the DC component is going to vanish when EV naught over H bar is equal to K or when 2 EV naught over H bar is equal to 2K, okay? Which means that you are going to see this Shapiro steps only at even integer um, uh, relations where omega J equals an even integer times the drive frequency, not all integers, the odd integers are gone. And therefore, the only the even steps are going to survive, okay? So the Josephson, effect essentially gives two signatures of the Majorana fermion. One of them is that the frequency of the AC voltage uh, is going to be half of what it is seen in standard Josephson effect. So there is a fractional AC Josephson effect. And the consequence of this fractional AC Josephson effect is that there are only even Shapiro steps and the odd Shapiro steps are going to vanish. Okay. So uh, is this clear? Any questions, anyone? Okay, if not, let me go ahead. 
so typically you know when we were working on this long time back uh, we thought that if this effect was ever detected any time it would be through this ac josephson effect because we are completely ignorant of how experiments were done because you know it's really measuring a frequency however it turns out that these frequencies are in such high regime for typical superconductors that these are very difficult to measure and much easier is to find these shapes steps what shapiro did okay so essentially this experiment was done by rokinson's group and uh, this is a nature physics in 2012 and what they found is that uh, again with the same geometry that is you have a nanoware you see here that there is a nanoware and they have found out that they can make a junction out of this nanoware so it becomes a superconducting junction and then they were looking for shapiro steps okay so when the magnetic field is zero the applied magnetic field is zero and you have typical asof superconductivity which is induced you see that there is a even step at n equal to 0 and then a odd step at uh, n equal to 1 and so on but as you increase this magnetic field you see that this odd steps out here they just disappear and only the even steps survives okay so that's taken to be a signature of this uh, you know the presence of this marana modes in this kind of geometry so this is also um this is also basically a signature that you know your josephson frequency if you could have measured it is going to go uh, is going to be halved so essentially that's this that's the experimental signature for this fractional josephson effect okay so the so coming back to this marana modes the presence of this marana modes essentially leads to its imprint on the josephson junctions and this imprint essentially turns out to be quite a qualitatively robust effect so you have half uh you have fractionalization of your josephson frequency it becomes omega over 2 instead of omega and you have uh, also disappearance of the odd shapiro steps so only the even shapiro steps are going to survive so essentially uh okay so essentially this is what i wanted to say about uh, this josephson stuff okay uh, so without getting into the details of this uh, there is another thing that i wanted to show and i'm not going to explain this uh it turns out that if you are looking at this current voltage characteristic okay so let me just tell a few words so okay so the way you do this uh, look at this junction is different for theorists and experimentals okay for theorists is much easier to put in an applied voltage and measure the current that's very simple from this josephson relation okay uh, something like this because that gives you a direct equation for phi and you can just put it in the expression of current much more difficult theoretically is to determine the phase and the current provided you are biasing the system with the current so if you are driving the system with a current and you want to measure the voltage you have to solve this equation okay uh out here okay that because you are putting in a current you are going to generate a voltage which in turn is going to make this phase time dependent and therefore it turns out that one can uh, write down an equation for that this is the josephson current that you have which is for example for a sof superconductor this quantity would be some i times sin phi okay and this is the drive current so you are driving it with i and also you are basically putting an extra uh, dc current okay uh, sorry ac current which is sin omega t now if you do such a thing you can find out you know the the phase uh, of this is a complicated function of of course the input current and this is a much richer structure theoretically and it turns out that the current voltage characteristic that you have here we are plotting this v versus i it turns out that these have multiple steps at different frequencies okay i don't want to get into the details of this but the only thing that i am going to tell you is that these steps have a, a self similar structure and you have level 1 steps where this n is non zero and you know so okay so the level 0 steps are the ones in which all these integers n m p are all not there they are zero so it's p equal to n 
and that is in units of uh, that uh, of course uh, h bar omega d but then there are the first level steps where n is non zero and you have all others to be zero okay which means that interestingly uh, you have you should have n plus or minus 1 over n omega that is called the second level steps okay so the first level steps are only for capital n and the second level steps are for small n and so on but if you do this for the pus superconductor what we saw is that this becomes plus or minus 2 over n instead of 1 over n and that's another distinct feature of this four pi periodic junction okay so if you drive these junctions you can also pick up this feature so uh, to conclude this marana fermion discussion like to say that this marana fermion uh, modes uh, they are not fermions they are you know non they are particles which has non abelian statistics and stuff but these modes are realized at the edges of superconductor uh, if the pairing is unconventional like p wave or something like that and they have they have distinct signature both in tunneling conductance and in josephson effect and out of this signature the josephson effects are particularly interesting because they lead to fractional josephson uh fractional ac josephson effect huffing of this uh, frequency and uh, josephson frequency and uh, uh uh loss of the odd shapiro steps okay so uh, overall this is uh, these are the methods which can be used to uh, so to sort of pick up the signatures of this uh, marana modes then some of these have been done experimentally although you know the results are contentious and uh, uh, so more experiments need to be done to our, in this platforms and possible other platforms to really uh, seal this uh, issue so i think i'm going to stop here for the marana part and take questions and if there are no uh, so and after i'm done with that i'm going to start with the wild fermions that's the next topic of the course okay so questions regarding this uh sir hello yeah yes uh yeah sir so uh, when we are inducing a p wave superconductivity yeah do we lose the andrew bound states or do we still have them and uh, no no we do like, have them so when you have p wave superconductivity the andrew bound states are right here you see this okay. for the pp junction mm -hmm. if you have two p wave superconductors you have all these andrew bound states which are right at the localized right at the junction okay but this has uh, unconventional periodicity and that reflects some topological property that will link so to the existence of that, uh, myronas uh, that's right so you see okay. that these andrew bound states have a 4 pi periodicity because it's phi over 2 and that a mm -hmm. wave it looks like it's sin square phi by 2 and so you should have a 4 pi periodicity but it's not right it's a yeah, yeah. you can write it as sin phi and all that yeah so, Actually, these are the two pi periodicity, and that's where all the difference comes from. Okay. Yeah. Uh, sir, another thing I had read recently about uh, some, I mean, some paper by uh, Shankar Das Sharma where he had said that even Andrew Brown states uh, could give some four pi periodicity. Uh, in what context? I need to know. Uh, but. Uh, These are Andrew bound states, and these do give four pi periodicity. So, so I mean, okay. Uh, I mean, to state uh, more uh, precisely, like even when we have a non-topological system, we could still have a four pi periodicity. Uh, okay. So I so yeah. So there are cases like this where you could uh, you could manufacture uh, cases where you could have this four pi periodicity, uh, but. but these are really really fragile you know so even if you just tweak it a little bit from some very specific points on the parameter space your 4 pi it would be gone right right okay so i don't really know shankar's paper i don't know what he has written so i have to sort of look at it but uh, but there have been discussions regarding whether 4 pi periodicity can appear from anything other than the sandeep bound states mm -hmm. uh most cases that i know uh the answer is yes but these are extremely few points in your parameter space right right uh sir yeah another question uh, so uh, yeah. this shapiro steps 
Yes. Uh, so in the case of myronas, we have the uh, some of them vanishing, some of the steps. Right. So can we expect something similar for uh, Z3 paraphonians or something where uh, more of them vanish? No, but uh, okay. So first of all, um, I don't really know how to address this Z3 paraphonians out here because uh, because you see this myronas, you know, uh, normally I can write them. I mean. is appeared in non interacting system very strangely uh, you know i can have a feeling for their wave function and see how things are right right but for z3 paraphonians i really don't know how to come up with that form where uh, for example having superconductor or things like that so mm -hmm. that i am not familiar with so okay. don't really know okay all right okay any other questions okay if not let me switch to the discussion about while semi metals so that would be the next topic try to cover it as soon as uh, as quickly as possible because i'm running out of time so till now whatever i have discussed regarding this topological materials has been in lower dimension two or one okay so that's the standard thing here we'll move into three dimensional uh, metals and the thing that we are going to discuss are this while and pseudo spin one fermions okay so uh, so let's just look at you know what the origin of this while fermions is so in the context of field theory they come came due to some special property of the dirac equation as was first pointed out by while so to understand that let's first look at this dirac equation and where you know these gammas are matrices uh uh which uh, character which are used to construct this equation so the dimension of this gamma matrices depend on uh the dimension of your uh, system so in so typically these um, so typically you know these so for example in d equal to 3 they are four dimension and so on so forth okay uh in d equal to 1 it turns out and 2 it turns out that this gamma matrices can be just written in terms of this pauli matrix okay they are just two by two matrices and uh, but whatever be their representation they always satisfy gamma not square equal to identity and gamma i square is equal to minus of identity that's the standard thing so for example if i take a d equal to 3 one possible parametrization of this um, of this gamma matrices is that uh, gamma not could be written uh, so it can be written as outer product of two pauli matrices okay so uh, gamma not can be written as uh, identity cross tau x okay and gamma i can be written as sigma y cross i tau y so you see that gamma not square is tau x square which is identity and gamma i square is minus identity now the property that is interesting to us is that in odd dimensions you can construct a matrix which is called a gamma phi which uh, so if d is equal to 2k plus 1 then uh, d equal to 3k is 1 but uh, this is a formula for any any d so what do you do you take this gamma matrices and just take the product of them now even dimension these products are just uh, just turns out to be identity okay so there is no gamma phi in even dimension however in odd dimensions it turns out that this is a new matrix okay and most importantly it com commutes with all the velocity matrices of the problem okay so uh, it always commutes with gamma not gamma i and it anti commutes with all gamma matrices okay. so it's a speed, pretty special matrix now the point is that you see this dirac equation out here okay and this mu takes value 0 1 2 3 in three dimension so if i multiply from the right with um, gamma not then you see that the, i have a time derivative i del t and then there are these velocity matrices which may uh, which multiplies the space derivative 
and then you have a m gamma naught okay because this m has to be multiplied with gamma naught now the point is that if i have massless dirac fermion so at this m is not zero the hamiltonian gamma naught gamma i del x okay that commutes with this gamma phi this doesn't happen if you have mass to be non zero and this doesn't happen in even dimension where you cannot have a gamma phi but in odd dimension for massless dirac fermions you find that there is a matrix gamma phi which uh, which has a simultaneous eigen basis with the dirac hamiltonian and therefore you can classify the uh, eigen states according to their eigen states of uh, uh, according to the eigen numbers of gamma phi so this gamma phi determines the chirality and these are the massless chiral fermions in the equal to 3 so uh, essentially if you take this representation of the gamma matrices it turns out that uh, the h plus or minus the two um, eigen states of gamma phi corresponding to plus 1 and minus 1 are just uh, p dot sigma with minus or plus sign okay so this p dot sigma essentially is the form of this wild fermions and they are always chiral okay so so the idea about this uh, about this is that if you have massless fermions in d equal to 3 uh, massless uh, so you can have in principle chiral massless fermions in d equal to 3 and the thing to see is that in condensed matter system whether one gets this from any kind of bank structure now in general it's reasonably simple to think that this will indeed arise because you see in a generic condensed matter system you have many bands and these bands may intersect with each other and do stuff and every touching of this band in three dimension is like a wild fermion in the band basis because you know there are two bands which cross each other and therefore this crossing essentially means that uh, there is a if you are sufficiently close to the crossing point there is a wild fermion that is sitting there because in the band basis uh, you always have a sigma dot k type of linear dispersion as we have seen in case of graphene okay. but this is in three dimension so the point why these are not so widespread is that fast for this to have any effect in transport or other things they have to be near the this touching has to happen near the fermi level because if it is something deep inside uh, you know at very small uh, at, so deep inside the valence uh, band if it's a uh, crossing between two valence bands which are very far away from the fermi level then thus that those crossings do not really have any contribution to any kind of transport or other things that you can throw and therefore those don't come okay so uh, there has to be a touching between a conduction band and a valence band that's important the second thing is that which is crucial is that now if you have such a touching and if you basically change the parameters of your hamiltonian a little bit maybe you just want to you know tweak some uh, hopping parameter or put some stress or do something to the material the band touching should not go away okay uh, this can only happen if they are protected by some kind of symmetry otherwise the band touchings are not robust and by changing some parameters you can easily do away with the band so the point to understand here is that there is a crucial role which is played by the symmetry operators in uh, for uh, this kind of um, wild fermions okay so for this for this kind of wild fermions to occur so what are the symmetries so typically in a time reverse so i so while discussing this um, topological insulator we found that time reversal symmetry is one okay in a crystal which has a inversion center inversion symmetry is another and of course there is a spin rotational symmetry in case you haven't put in a magnetic field now this spin so these three symmetries can make bands degenerate okay that's the standard thing so you need to lift two of this symmetry and maintain one for this wild modes to take place so that the bands they are not degenerate and they need to cross and also but this crossing is protected by the symmetry now this spin rotational symmetry is the easiest to lift it is typically lifted by a spin orbit coupling and that's why all these wild materials have strong spin orbit coupling 
And then there are two possibilities. One, where you can have this time reversal symmetry, which is lifted by your magnetic field or things like that. Or you have an inversion symmetry, which can be broken in certain crystals because they are non center symmetric. That is, they don't have an inversion center. Okay. We are going to discuss both. But um, uh, first, let's just say that two of these symmetries are left and uh, we have just one of them. Then, we, then if the parameters are right, we are going to see a crossing of two bands, one conduction and one valence at the Fermi moment here. And the fermions near these crossings must have, uh, uh, must have a wildlife dispersion. Okay. So there is one point here which you would like to emphasize. While discussing topological insulators, we found out that for any crystal theory, any theory on a lattice, we cannot have a single Dirac modes. Okay, we always have two because uh, because of some topological consideration. That is, if you circle around a Dirac um, cone, you pick up a phase two pi, and just from this, you can show that in the entire Billouin zone, you must have an even number of Dirac fermions, uh, so that you know the total phase that you pick up when you traverse through the edge of the Billouin zone is always zero. Okay. That goes by the name of this uh, Nielsen uh, Ninomia theorem, I think. And uh, it's, it's typically also called a no go theorem. That is, if you start with a lattice theory, you cannot have an odd number of Dirac fermions. So, this is also there for this wild fermion. So, within the Brillouin zone, you must have an even number of wild fermions, and there is no way to get around that. Okay. In any theory which starts from uh, a, a crystal type of uh, stuff. So from a uh, from a lattice theory. Okay. So uh, therefore, the crossings, if it happens, always occurs in pairs. Okay. And there is a very easy way to understand this. So suppose you have an inversion symmetry which is not broken. You have broken time reversal symmetry, and let's say that there are bands which are Kramer pairs which crosses at some. So say you have both time reversal. So, sorry, say you have broken inversion, but you have time reversal symmetry. Okay. So then you see that there has to be an even number of crossing because if two bands cross at K0, they are also going to cross at minus K0. In fact, it turns out that uh, there has to be at least four. Uh, no, they are going to cross also at minus K0, and then you have at least two. Okay. So, uh, okay. So suppose we have such a crossing, then what? Well, near this crossing, I can always write this Hamiltonian, effective Hamiltonian, which arises around this crossing, uh, because I'm involved uh, just with two bands at some functions of F0, F1, F2, and F3, which are functions of K. And then you could have sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z dependence and an identity. And that's the most general form because in, it's a two by two matrix. And this is the most general form of any two by two matrix that you can write. Now, the point is that suppose you have this H of K and I expand it around the Dirac point. So what I'm going to have, I'm typically going to have linear dispersion, which depends on the Sigma. On top of that, I can have a V naught times Delta K, which comes from this F naught. Okay. So typical dispersion of this while Fermions is an identity uh, matrix together with all the spin signals. And typically, there, this classifies them as two types of semimetals, uh, wild semimetals. One of them in which this V0 is small, and these are called type 1 semimetals. And here, what happens is that if you just ignore V0, you see that there's a linear band crossing at the wild point. Okay? However, if you have a large V0, what happens is that now you have lines of crossing or surfaces of crossing, and you have cons large V0 implies open constant uh, contours in momentum space of same energy, and these are called type 2 semimetals. So we are going to discuss mostly this type 1 semimetals. We are not going to bother ourselves with type, but they are the two things. The other thing, uh, so this is roughly an introduction of how, a very brief one, of how wild semimetals come in. Now, let me just mention one more thing, okay? 
suppose i have time reversal invariance um, and so there are two symmetries that i can break okay i have a choice so imagine that i have broken spin rotational symmetry and then let's say i break inversion symmetry and keep time reversal symmetry in this case it means that if there is a while crossing at a not okay with velocity v there must be a while crossing at minus k not with velocity minus v okay this means that these two while modes have to be have exactly the same berry phase one can work this out and one can show that if the product of v and k are both the same then the berry phase picked up from these two while nodes are exactly the same so by this nielsen ninomia or the no go theorem it turns out that if you uh, conserve time reversal and break inversion your while nodes must be at least four so they have to come in integer multiples of four and not two on the other hand if you break time reversal and uh, keep inversion then of course you can have two while nodes and those are the simpler ones to construct okay so there is a distinction uh, as to what symmetry is broken and how many while nodes at minimum you need to have okay so any questions till now is this point clear anything which is unclear uh, hello sir i have a one question yes please uh, sir uh, i didn't understand what is the difference between the topological insulator while semi metal or oh, is that dimension you see uh, in topological uh, insulators the band crossings in the bulk the three dimensional bulk got deep inside the so they are very far away from the fermi surface and these are insulating materials okay the okay. dirac things appear at the surface so all the gapless features are there in the surface however for wild semi metal they are three dimensional semi metals so the crossings occur at the fermi energy and they involve all three components of the dirac spin Okay, sir. Okay. Okay. Uh, that means uh, wheel semi metal will be three D cases, but uh, it is coming in the surface for topological insulator. Uh, for topological insulator, the bulk is an insulator, and the surface carry current or whatever. Yes. And for the wild stuff, it's three D uh, semi metal. Okay. 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 Thank you, sir. Sure. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. so there are several unconventional properties of this wild semi metals that i am going to discuss now and this is something that uh, you know which is uh, which uh, which made it so interesting so the first thing that i am going to talk about are the surface states corresponding to this wild semi metals and these are called fermi arc states okay now this fermi arc states there is uh, you know showing this analytically is difficult but let me try to give you an example as to why these states should occur okay so um let me try to sort of look at this picture okay so uh this is quite small sorry about this this axis is kz and this x these two this plane is kx ky okay and there are two dirac uh, so two while points one at uh, let's say uh in this plane okay which corresponds to kz equal to let's say k not Minus k not, and the other one above that, which is at a plane k z equal to plus k not. Let's just assume that. So now imagine that I start from uh, here, which is uh, k z equal to minus pi, and this point at the top is k z equal to pi. Okay. So as I start from k z equal to minus pi, till I come up with k z equal to minus k not. these planes are ordinary so each plane for each kz is an ordinary charn insulator sorry it's an ordinary insulator and its charn number is just zero okay but now if i cross the first one because this while nodes can uh, act as source and sink of charn numbers okay as i cross the first one you know the planes in between minus k not and plus k not Are typical charn insulators with 
uh, non zero charm number for the bulk two dimensional uh, theory okay so these are like you know quantum hall insulators without the magnetic field typical charm insulators that come so it turns out that between minus k not and plus k not i have a bunch of quantum hall systems okay charm insulators which has h state therefore what will happen if i project this into a, a surface what will happen is that between this minus k not and plus k not i am going to have a host of the surface states okay and that will take an that typically takes an arc like form on the surface and these are your fermi arc states so what happens is the following you see that if i start with k z equal to minus pi and i take the plane k z equal to minus pi which is this surface out here then i have a standard insulator which has no charm number now i keep on increasing this and as i move out from here i have uh, i have entered a region where i have a finite charm uh, number for the bands because i have crossed one while node and for all planes between kz equal to minus k not and plus k not i i see that i have a finite charm number for the 2d theory which means i have finite h states once i cross away i go above the above k not above kz equal to k not for kz greater than k not uh, i again come to the regime of uh, trivial insulator because the total charm number that i am going to accumulate as i go out in this direction is zero therefore the fermi arcs are going to occur between at two points on the surface okay between this kz equal to minus k not and plus k not and they are going to sort of form a arc in between okay so they terminate at the special points on the surface okay so that's the fermi arc uh, picture so the point is that this wild semi metals always have this very interesting edge states which are which takes an arc like shape and there are two parts to this arc okay uh, one on the surface at the top and the other at the surface to the bottom and at these special points which are direct projection of this while nodes on the surface they uh, propagate in the bulk the decay length of this goes to zero when it uh, sorry infinity or decay uh, so they don't decay they propagate in the bulk at these special points and together the top and the bottom surface forms a closed fermi like uh, surface okay but each of them are uh, completely different they form an open arc so that's the while uh, semi metal for you and also this leads to an anomalous hall effect because because there are this arc uh, edge modes between k not and minus k not i one typically has a sigma xy which depends on e square over h times the number of such k modes that you have and it turns out that it's e square over h times 2 k not okay so that's the anomalous hall effect that you find out that can be that's a direct consequence of having this 2d planes between kz equal to minus k not and plus k not and each plane essentially leads to is like one quantum hall system and leads to one e square over h quanta of conductance uh, making it total of e square over h each times 2k okay. there is an extra factor of 2 pi which comes in when you do the calculation carefully but that's roughly the physical picture okay. so that's the first point any questions uh hello sir yeah uh, so basically sir we define charm number for uh, 2d systems right you do go around a, a point and to define what the charm number of their particular point right that's right that's right so basically that's why you said that you take different planes and then each each that's plane right. has a so separate charm number that's right so to basically have a charm number i need to define a 2d plane and i'm just doing it using kz to be the marker for that you know as i vary this kz i have different 2d planes the planes of course is kx ky plane but each of them has a kz index uh right right and uh, here the while points uh, and that part i didn't really get it here they said that while points are the like the uh, creator or the uh, year of the charm number yeah so it turns out that uh, if there are two planes on two sides of a while point okay uh, then one can show that 
if one of them is topologic if one of them has states which are topologically trivial the other one will have to states which are topologically non trivial so this is a consequence of this wild points you know uh, so your char number do change when you move through a wild point uh, uh, okay okay okay, okay. and they can only change if you move through a wild points so these wild points which are typically like vortices in momentum space they are called as source or sink of char numbers right sir also oh, sir i have read about that a fermi's string really like the beris flux sir. so how do they those are related and in really pretty sure so this is the argument you see corresponding to every plane with a char number okay yes sir you have a projection on the surface which leads to a you know so this charn number is where the beri flux comes in so each of this plane between this while points k not and minus k not if you calculate the hall conductivity there all you are doing is a beri phase calculation because hall conductivity is just like a beri phase okay the alternate way of seeing this is that corresponding to every plane between k not and minus k not you are going to have an edge state a chiral edge state which is going to give you this conductivity okay and the fermi arc uh, right so okay okay portions any other thing which is okay so in the last uh, few minutes that i have well uh, not few quite uh, few actually uh, so let me first try to look into this uh, the other um, aspect of this wild semi metal which is called the chiral anomaly so let me try to explain this in a bit details because this is one of this rather interesting points that one has so let me see if i can explain this a bit okay so here is a cartoon caricature of two wild nodes in a 3d material and one of them has a plus uh, plus vorticity and the other one has a minus vorticity okay but to understand this chiral anomaly first think of a one dimensional system okay now in a one dimensional system you have two fermi points the right point and the left point okay because this is like saying that you know you have a just think of a k x square minus twice m dispersion p square over twice m dispersion that you typically study and that means you have one parabolic band and then if there is a chemical potential it cuts it at two point two points right and the right point is called uh, the right fermi point and the left one is called the left fermi point so there are two fermi points and if you linearize the dispersion around this fermi point you see that they have opposite velocity so they are the right movers and left movers okay so one dimensional physics at low energies is all about this left movers and right movers at the two fermi points now if you apply an electric field to this then clearly you know from semi classical equation of motion h k x dot is the force semi classical force and that's e times c e. e times the electric field okay so that's the semi classical equation of motion now because this j x is any v and n is roughly like k x in one dimension because it's it has the same dimension one can show that this dn dt goes as dk dt and it's proportional to d e e over h bar so i'm doing the very hand waving calculation and therefore the current you know which theta which is this times the velocity um, times the charge has opposite signs in the right and the left uh, fermi points okay because velocity is has opposite signs so if i now calculate jx minus jl uh, i find that jx is e capital e by h bar times an e times a velocity okay and uh, that's just any v so in units of that velocity being 1 i have this 2e square over h which is uh, times e and this means that i am sort of as a function of the electric field i am pushing electrons from the right to the left fermi point that of course depends on the direction of the electric field but you know you can choose a direction and then you are going to push the electrons from the right to the left fermi point and this phenomenon is known as chiral anomaly okay because you just change the chiralty as a function of this electric 
However, in condensed matter, this is not all because you have these other electrons which are otherwise inert. But if you push too many electrons, you know, in the other Fermi point, they are going to interact with each other because of Coulomb repulsion. And they're going to sort of tell you at some point that you have pushed too many of us from the right to the left point and you shouldn't be pushing anymore. And that interaction effect is encoded by putting a phenomenological uh, uh, decay constant, which tells you that, uh, you know, there is this 2HE, which is there, but the difference is also going to sort of receive a negative contribution characterized by this one over tau. It just tells you that if you push too many, if this delta n becomes very large, the rate at which you push electrons from the right to the left Fermi point also becomes small. This essentially means that in the steady state, you do come, as, come across with a current, okay? And that's because if your dn dt is zero, that you have a steady state, your delta n is 2e h over e times tau. Now, oops, sorry. Now I can trade off this tau, which is a decay constant in terms of a mean free path divided by the velocity of these fermions. And therefore you have a steady state current, which you can from, uh, get from this. So the steady state current is delta n times E times V, okay? And therefore uh, this current is just two E square over H E times L, where L is the typical uh, mean free path of these fermions, okay? So, or typical length scale that comes because of electron-electron interaction or disorder or whatever. Okay. So the point is this. So in principle, one can move electrons from a right Fermi point to the left Fermi point in D equal to one. And that, that's the classic chiral anomaly. Okay. There is a field theoretic way of deriving this and it's surprisingly complicated. It requires, you know, it requires computation of Jacobian of a field theory, which is you know something that you typically normally never do, but uh, that's also another way of getting into this kind of anomaly. But there is some simple explanation. Uh, in the wild semi-metal, something interesting happens. You see that wild semi-metal. First of all, oops, sorry. Uh, so wild semi-metal, first of all, is not a 1D system, it's a 3D system, okay? So the first thing that you need to convert it into a 1D system is to apply a magnetic field. So if you apply a magnetic field along Z, the Hamiltonian becomes sigma Z KZ part. That's not affected by the magnetic field because you know uh, magnetic field doesn't have any orbital effect in the direction where it's applied. But the XY plane, now sees a magnetic field and solving for the energy dispersion there is just like a two-dimensional Landau level problem similar to that in graphene, okay? Now we know that in graphene, when this kind of magnetic field is applied, you find these Landau levels, but these Landau levels go as square root of mod n, okay? So these are the Landau level index. So this is En, that's the solution of the 2D problem. So your Hamiltonian becomes sigma z k. This, uh, excuse me for one second. Yeah, sorry. So your um, Landau level essentially uh, becomes c times square root of mod n. Uh, so for n equal to zero, you have a zero energy state. And the only dispersion is this h bar vf sigma z kz. Okay. And since this sigma z takes opposite values at uh, plus and minus uh, wild points, therefore you see that you have mapped this problem for the, in the presence of this magnetic field at n equal to zero to a one dimensional problem. Now, if you put in an extra electric field that has to be in the direction of B, okay, that because it has to couple to kz, you find that you are going to, generate a one dimensional tidal anomaly, okay? And therefore the 3D wild fermions as a analog of this 1D chiral anomaly and it's called the 3D wild anomaly, okay? This, whereas in the 1D case, we're transferring electrons from the right Fermi point to the left Fermi point. 
here you are going to transfer electrons from the while mode with charge number 1 to while mode with charge number minus 1 just opposite chirally okay so any questions regarding this Uh, sir, can you please again explain why it is called an anomaly? Oh, I didn't quite get anomaly that. because you see, normally what happens is that when you put in an electric field or something, you know, typically current is concentrated on Fermi near the Fermi points. Okay, uh, here you you are moving this electron from a point to the rightmost point in your Fermi surface to the leftmost point. That's a large gap, okay? And also you change chirality. So this is anomalous. This is not like standard transport in uh, metals. Uh, right, right, okay. Sir. okay. Questions? So you see the interesting thing about this 3D system is that because the, the magnetic field is used to basically localize the other two degrees of freedom. Okay. And then uh, it turns out that for the choice n equal to zero, which is the lowest energy state, you basically have just a one degree of freedom in your system, which is this KZ. And then it just reduces to a effective 1D problem. And then by applying this electric field, you just get back this 1D stuff. And uh, the math is uh, rather straightforward and is done in this review article by Yoshvin and others whose reference I'm going to send you. But uh, I'm not going to do the math, but let me just tell you this. Yeah, so then you see that just as in 1D, you had something like uh, dn dt proportional to E, e squared over H E here, of course, you need a both the electric and magnetic field and they need to be in the same direction. Okay. So that's the whole point. So the statement is that there is non-conservation of electron density at each while node in the presence of this electric and magnetic field. And it, one can move particles from one uh, node to another. Okay. So that's the Chiral anomaly for wild semi metals, which I wanted to talk about. Okay. So, also, there are some pretty interesting signatures as far as the experimentalists are concerned. So for example, the magnetoconductivity. Uh, so, if you put in a magnetic field along Z and try to measure resistance as a function of you know, your uh, voltage, it turns out that the conductivity essentially goes as B squared and it gives a negative magneto resistance, which is different from the standard uh, expectation. Okay, and uh, okay, so that's another uh, property that is interesting. Okay, so now let me go ahead and talk a bit about experiments with this wild semi metals. So, the first thing which is interesting here is that uh, the detection of this, which was done for tantalum arsenide, this TAS system, again was done using this RPS. And what they found is that it's not very clear from here, but what they found is that there are these arc states, you know, arc-like states, which terminates at specific point on the surface. Okay, this is at z equal to zero. This is at one uh, z edge of the sample, and this was uh, done by several groups, and you know, they they found this thing, and this was taken to be the signature of this wild semi metal. Okay. Um, okay. So this is all that I wanted to say about wild stuff. So I'm going to go to something called multi wild semi metals now. But if there is any question, I can take this now. Okay, so the last thing that I want to talk about today is this uh, thing about the, this really interesting uh, uh, possible material called the multi wild semi metal, which was first uh, uh, first sort of theoretically postulated by Barnavik and his collaborators. 
So what they notice, so they were playing with symmetry of materials. Okay, and trying to see when you can have these wild nodes. And what the result they came up with is that wild nodes with same chirality, that is where the char number for each of them, when you the char number that you pick up or the vorticity that you pick up when you circle around each of them is the same, they may be fused together. Okay. And that leads to uh, something called a multi wild semimeter. Okay. And this only happens if you have appropriate symmetries in particular point group symmetries, uh, such that the merging of these wild semi-metals may be robust. Okay. So how does this happen? So to see this, imagine that you have a discrete rotational symmetry in your system. So that's a symmetry by m-fold rotation about z, cm. Okay, so typically in systems, you have m equal to one, two, or three, and that's uh, what is seen in lattice systems. So, but I'm, I, we can talk about m fold rotation about z. So, typically, when it acts on your Hamiltonian, this m fold rotational symmetry leads to a Hamiltonian where the k vectors are transformed to Rm k, where Rm is the rotation matrix corresponding to this m fold symmetry. Now, for any of this rotation, there exists a symmetry direction, which I'm going to take z for this particular purpose. So, that if you are on the z axis, then Rmk is equal to k. Now, that is easy to understand because imagine that I rotate around the z axis. If I have a momentum which has only finite z component, then that momentum is invariant under the rotation and therefore Rmk is k. Therefore, if Rmk is just k, then Cm commutes with Hk. That is easy to see from here, which means that you have simultaneous eigenstates of this rotation operator as well and uh, hk. So this means that you may have degenerate states on that line, that special axis of rotation. And as you move on, move out from this line, you know, you are going to see that uh, this degeneracy is going to be broken. So you will have a wild-like structure. Now it turns out, Barnavig and others analyze this problem in details. And it turns out that if you have the direction of the symmetry, then uh, as you move away from the uh, move away from uh, this particular point where this uh, crossing is, uh, in the direction of symmetry, you still have linear dispersion. Okay, So there is nothing that you can do. But because of this extra symmetry in the transverse direction corresponding to the symmetry axis, you can have uh, not only linear dispersion, you can have quadratic or cubic uh, dispersions as well. So for example, this J, which tells you this, uh, what this uh, dispersion is, could be integers like one, two, or three. Okay, And this J is same as this M, and this has to do with this M-fold rotational symmetry. Okay. But the, and there you see that if you have linear dispersion, this is how the bands look. If you have M J equal to two, this is like how the bands look in the xy direction, and this is for j equal to 3. So the Hamiltonian of beam is also understandable. It just determine, it just depends on this cos of n, m times phi p, or cos 2 phi p or 3 phi p, when j is 2 or 3. And this phi is the rotational, uh, this azimuthal angle in the xy plane, perpendicular to the symmetry direction. Okay. Symmetry direction is always taken to be z okay, out here. That has a linear dispersion on so interestingly, what happens is that, so, uh, okay. So now what happens is that if you, and this is why it's called coalescing of wild modes, that if you now put a field, a strain, for example, which spoils this rotational symmetry, it turns out that this kind of nonlinear dispersion, this kind of nonlinear Hamiltonian splits up into two linear or three linear Hamiltonians. And therefore, you have not one crossing with this nonlinearity characterized by J. You have multiple crossing J such linear wild modes. And that is why it's called coalescing of wild nodes. So J or M wild nodes essentially coalesce to form this nonlinear dispersion. Okay? So this is why it's called a multi-wild semimeter. 
So this multi-wild semi-metals also has their uh, basically signatures, which are distinct. The first one is that the topological charge as you go around each of these wild modes is just J or K, uh, J, that's the uh, number of wild nodes that coalesce to form this multi-wild semi-metal. And this J shows up in all quantities such as, you know, conductivities and collective mode behavior and everything. So these multi-wild semi-metals have quite distinct signatures, uh, even experimental signatures compared to wild semi-metals. And that's determined by their topological index J. Okay. So I think I'm going to stop here. This is all I wanted to say about this wild and multi-wild semi-metals. In the next class, we are going to start with the pseudo-spin fermions.